there, should, there it goes. So. Well, welcome, everybody. So a couple of questions right off the bat. How many of you have been using DSC? Started. You don't have to be like masters at it, but have started the work with stuff like that. How many of you want to get started using DSC? OK, great answer, because automation goes away. Everything's configuration, right? Uh, it's seriously. Think about it. Automation goes away. Everything's configuration. Everything you know how to automate, we're making resources for that. In other words, we, we you know that old joke on the t-shirt that said, don't anger me or I'll replace you with a script? We did. <laughs> you might be the guy creating the custom resources and doing that automation, but think about you're getting rid of everybody else, right? Because we don't need them anymore. We just make it and then we'll use it as a part of the config and stuff like that. This is a huge evolution into the direction that we're going. Would you agree that maybe DSC is sometimes seems complicated? Yes. <laughs> Confusing. Yes. Yeah, we're going to help you with that. Also, some of the best practices. Now, I'm going to have it on a slide here, but a couple of a couple of notes. First of all, when we did these slide topics, there were, you know, this was six, seven months ago when we came up with the actual topics. We didn't know where we were going to be in the magical road through DSC at that time. We're in a very unusual spot. In other words, we're almost <laughs> there, halfway there, just about there. In other words, if you're working with 4.0, we've got an update to 4.0, right? right? The 3,000, I don't, can never remember yeah, the KVC. Steve knows. Yes, Steve knows. <laughs> There's an update to 4.0 that you will never know because it's still 4.0. And then there's WMF5, right, that we're in preview release with. We're going to be talking about stuff that is primarily WMF5 because that's the where you want to focus your thought process. But I want to just give you kind of a side note. Some of this isn't going to work in 4.0 right now, so you've got to kind of balance that. Also, I want to kind of point out, how many of you have been doing the PowerShell thing for a long time, like four or five years? So you know that when we all, when PowerShell V1 came out, there were no best practices. It was kind of like, well, how, what, how, how am I supposed to do this? I don't know, however it works. Good luck with that. Now, when you want to go out and make an advanced function, we've got some really clear best practices that have been built over time and experience. So we're going to talk about best practices with DSC, but DSC is changing so rapidly right now because it's in development, you got to take a little bit of a grain of salt with this. Yes? Now, we're not going to cover every possible, but are you yawning already? Am I that freaking boring? <laughs> oh, it is hot in here. It is. It is. Hot air? Ooh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you got to take things with a grain of salt. What the, the topics that we're going to primarily focus on, we're not going to go through every possible thing, DSC is a big creature, are the primary, some hot points. And I'm so grateful that we have Dave Wyatt here. Because you guys probably have already figured out, if you didn't already know, between Stephen Morosky and Dave Wyatt, these are the guys that are educating all of us, including Microsoft, on, no, don't do it that way, man. <laughs> do it like this, or do it like this, yes? So we're going to have this more as a discussion. I want you to feel not just to ask questions, but give your own input if you're working with it, things that you've experienced, and that kind of stuff. Does that make sense? I also, we got stuff for you, some code examples for you, stuff like that. And now my slide doesn't want to suddenly, there it goes. Oh, we don't care about that one. <laughs> Open discussion, yada, yada, yada. Amazing wealth of information. Oh, work in progress. In other words, this is changing rapidly. So I'm going to give you some resources to keep up with. Now, um, the amazing wealth of information. A couple of things real quick. You guys have already experienced this. Should have planned for this, that this was not a Monday session. It was a Wednesday session. But while you're here, if you're working with DSC, you got to talk to these guys. Yeah? Sit down with them over lunch, that kind of thing. Talk to them. They can help. You can get better. Blah. Um, community involvement. I'm going to give you some links to keep that you're going to need to follow if you're working with DSC to keep you up on the latest things that are going. One of the best things you can do is stay involved. Go out to PowerShell.orgs. We've got DSC specific forums. I know because Dave answers almost every freaking question out there. So, but not only ask questions but contribute your experiences, especially if you are blazing trail with WMF5 right now. Also, this keeps you in touch with everybody, and it's a way that we can. Um, so stick with those forums. Now, this is where it's going to look like it's self-promotional. It's not. This is the, um, um, how many of you have at least heard of the, <laughs> the uh, DSC MBAs, the Microsoft Virtual Academy stuff? 
Okay, this stuff just released, right? And and and, and the other <coughs> way there's, there's two days. There's a getting started one, which is a day, and then there's an advanced one. Let me tell you the difference. Getting started one is actually the hardest one, I think. It's where it takes you through the basic concepts of DSC, gets you set up with your different pole server types. It also goes through a lot of best practices that we were making up at that moment. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but you have to understand, WMF5, the preview release, came out like three days before we shot this. We wanted to shoot it on the February preview release because a lot of the changes we needed to talk about <coughs> were in that release. And a lot of the things that we talk about as best practices in that are the things that we knew would be stable. They weren't experimental. And in fact, we show you how to tell when things are stable or experimental. So there's a lot of great, not only best practice information in that first day, but how to get this thing set up, how it works, getting all the concepts in, how to make a configuration, all that kind of stuff. Then day two is how you write your own custom ones. We also take you in, I'm gonna show you, give you some code examples. The difference of, I'm calling it the old way. I don't know if I'm allowed to call it the old way to write a custom resource like versus, versus the class defined way to write it. And you'll see that we're pushing you to do class defined. And if you're an IT pro, you can do class defined. Ooh, that's big developer. No, it's not big developer. It, well, it is, but you can do. It's easier. It's faster to do class defined. I think you'll be happier with it. I'm going to show you code where you're going to go, well, oh, that's a lot more work. Yeah, that's the old way. So we give you a lot of information there. So that's a great resource to check on. You get to hear Jeffrey's perspective on everything. And we have finger puppets. So it's. Oh, come on, when he does DSC in Linux and he explains how Windows and Linux talks to each other using finger puppets, come on, lighten up. That is. And by the way, when you're watching the video, watch Jeffrey's ties. <laughs> they change like every camera I'll shot. I'll just tell you, the, the, on, the, on the second day, the uh, next to the last module, what we, do, we decided we wanted to have a joke where he changed his tie, one, his tie once for one module. Well, he brought eight ties. So we decided that in one module, he changed his tie eight times. <laughs> so what happens is every time the camera goes to me, he's back there going, ah, and then he'll sit down and then he'll answer the question, right? <laughs> and it's a different tie. <laughs> <laughs> we waited, we, we were shooting this live, which is not something you usually <coughs> want to do, because we had like 4,000, whatever we had, 4,000 people in the chat rooms and all this. A guy got it on the second tie. And I, was, I didn't think anybody would catch it, but. And then in the last module, we just lined all the ties up behind us. It was hilarious, because you know him and his. Anyway, you don't care. Next. <laughs> so. I don't need to watch the movie anymore. <laughs> I, I know, I gave away the story. Spoiler alert. <laughs> you really need to see the finger puppets, though. And by the way, there's a, a, the finger puppets are my fault. And Dante has a special place in hell for me for having a distinguished engineer work with finger puppets. Believe me. I'm, so. I'm, you're going to get this slide, there. you're going to get these links, and I'm going to show you these documents towards the end, but there's a couple of things that you want. This is evolving very fast, and every new preview release, which, did they say when we were going to get the April next 30, one? 30. Okay, so, okay, I wanted to check, make sure. <laughs> so you know you're getting one at the end of April, that another preview release. I'm going to show you how to look at the uh, readme notes that come with that, the release notes. It's very detailed in there about what's stable, what's experimental, what they're doing. As a matter of fact, a lot of the code that's in there you want to play with and try it out for yourself. Um, also, I'm going to show you some additional documentation on when you work with doing custom resources. Microsoft has been really, really working hard at trying to create some best patterns and practices for us to help us out. So I want to show you those docs, but I also want to show you some real code too. And I want Dave to be able to interject and just talk about whatever he wants to talk about because he knows better than just about anybody else. Yes? Okay. There's no links up here for it, but another uh, community resource is out on GitHub, both PowerShell.org and Microsoft's uh, GSC resource kit. Say, say, say out loud, say out proud what this is. What? What you just <laughs> said. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, on GitHub, the, well, the, the community forks of the GSC resource kit are out on PowerShell.org's uh, organization. And Microsoft has also just open sourced the resource kit itself. Uh, so eventually we'll, we'll merge those community forks in and, and get rid of those copies. Did but you hear that? Yes. <clears throat> they open sourced the resource. Because here's the, here's the thing. If you were working with, and if you know what this, if you don't know what this is, that's fine. But because we'll, if you were working with X, all X web administration and yeah. something didn't work, we had a community one, C web administration. And if it did work, well, there's no way for us to get our code 
backwards into ex-web administration. Now, this is like a huge deal, guys. <laughs> you know the whole, we're getting open source? This is like major, major, major. So the community, you get to help everybody get better resources this way. So I think that's really important. I mean, that whole bit about non-Microsoft people contributing code to Windows, that this is the same thing. You contribute to the DSC resource kit. I don't know if it'll ship in box or not, but whatever, it's there. Which is really cool, and we can use everybody's help. Now, a couple of hot topics that um, I just wanted to kind of go through and let Dave carry off and go into all his directions is, um, one of the interesting things that happened in, in February at the preview release is if you've been working with the ELCM, the local configuration manager, that's that thing. I kind of think of it as like a little agent that's sitting there going, give me a config and I'll take care of the rest and I'll, I'll run it. You know, just get me the config, whether it's by push or pull, just give me a config and I'll take care of it. Got greatly enhanced. Also, the configuration of what you would write to control it got changed fairly dramatically and that's one of the first things I wanted to show you because here's the thing as you're learning DSC you're gonna hit the internet you're gonna hit the I almost said the the, the goog <laughs> the bang the whatever your favorite search engine is you're gonna hit whatever search engine you're gonna find resources you have to realize if you're looking at the old stuff or the new stuff right so if you're working with 4.0 you got the old stuff if you're working with um, 5 you got the new stuff so I just want to show you and I'm, I'm gonna give you copies of all this here's the uh, old way and I'll, uh, I may have to zoom this in here with the LCM. <coughs> yeah, I don't care. I broke it. LCM, no, let's not look at that. I, 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 will, I will make this a little bit larger, so don't panic. We well, can panic, it just won't matter. So if you've seen this on the internet, if you've done this, this is the old way, right? You, you, you did configuration, whatever you wanted to call it. <laughs> And then underneath Node, we had local configuration manager and some of the properties that you could set. Now, watch the new way. The IntelliSense now is awesome for this. I can't find my mouse. Oh, there it is. And the new way. Doesn't really look different, does it? But look, it is different. Look at the very top. You guys, if you write advanced functions, we're going to put commandlet binding in. Is that, oh, oh, right there. So DSE Local Configuration Manager, it's still a configuration under Node. We now have settings, and I want to point something out. This is a really simple one, but also when you're putting in, is it like a pull server? They've changed that. It's not, it's not Web Manager Download or Web Download Manager. It's now, I can bring up an LCM that has the new. I don't even remember that. Yeah, why, I just said how great the. Configuration Repository Web. Configuration Repository Web and Configuration Repository File, right? Share. Thank God you're here. <laughs> he and everybody, by the way, what a brilliant. I don't know if he caught his DSC session yesterday, but. The, um, I was going to see if I could show you this real quick, but um, let me go here. So there it is. The IntelliSense in this is now amazing. It gives you everything you need. I mean, everything. So you don't have to memorize, notice, I, well, I'm never going to memorize anything. So configuration repository web puts it out there for you. You can give it a name, uh, stuff. What's that? You're running April and WMF on I'm running what? April and WMF. April and WMF. Oh, we're not supposed to know about this. That's fine. You can tell them. It's okay. I, I, I. I. <laughs> <laughs> breaking NBA on YouTube. Oh, God. Yes, I am running the thing that you're going to, to get. So, yes. Anyways. So, no pictures. So, let's just say that you're going to love it. It's awesome. <laughs> Leave it at that. I don't know if you happen to see when the IntelliSense was up there, one of my favorite new features is the ability to have a separation between how you get your configurations and how you get your resources. So even if you're in a push mode for the configuration, you can still have a DSC pull server serving up the resource modules that just get downloaded on demand. Awesome. <clears throat> this is well worth your time. And again, you can check it out on the MBA. But when you're finding resources on the internet, make sure you're getting the new resources on the local configuration manager and the settings for them. There's a lot more settings. I'm going to show you one, uh, the debug mode all if you're doing the uh, if you're doing your own custom resource kind of uh, uh, work. Because that breaks immediately in resources. Debug mode uh, for smudge. 
force module? Yeah, okay. On the video, we did a haul. <laughs> Yeah, we wanted Not that. that. That's ever happened. Again. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to set up uh, uh, pull service. Push. By the way, sending push configurations. There's nothing wrong with that. First of all, it's great for a lab environment. It also works really well, in my experience, in a little bit larger scale. In other words, if you want to push your configuration, start DSC config and give it a list of computers you want to send the config to. You can do that even in pretty good size. That could be your initial way of getting configs out. There's nothing wrong with that. However, you're eventually going to want to go to a pull server. And you got you got three, well, two, SMB, right? Connect to a share. Super easy to set up. But then you've got HTTP, a much more professional way to do it. And here's in my opinion why. And you and you and first of all, have you guys ever uh, worked with IIS? Every day. I don't want to die. Don't laugh. That's not sexy. Have you ever made a website highly available? In other words, have you ever load balanced IIS? You want to talk about the cheapest, easiest way to not only have a pull server, but a load balanced pull server that can scale in size. They're cheap. You can have multiple different pull servers. What a great, cheap way. Plus, you get all your modules we get um, pushed out when, when people need them. It's awesome. But here's the thing. We saw everybody at the very beginning when 4.0 came out. HTTP or HTTPS. And people were saying, ah, oh, just put an HTTP one up. Yeah, these, are, these are your configurations. Do you want people knowing about your configuration? Do you want the guy with the black hat knowing what you're configuring out on your network? And God help you, I'm going to show you an example of this, but if you did make a mistake and actually put clear text credentials in your configs, <laughs> you really want HTTPS. So obviously in your head you're going, oh yeah, we, we want HTTP, HTTPS pull service. But what does that mean you need in order to make it HTTPS? Yeah. Which means you need a what in your office? Smart guy. Yeah, you need <laughs> <laughs> You need a PKI solution. Now, this is internal, so it's not like you have to spend a lot of money on certs, but you got to have a PKI solution. How many of you work do with PKI stuff? Because we're going to hit another best practice here that you're going to want to use that you can't use if you can't understand PKI and if you don't have an internal PKI solution. It doesn't matter whether it's Microsoft. They all pretty much boil down to the same thing. And really, when you get into it, if you're not looking at the math of the crypto stuff, it's really not that hard. It's a very simple thing. But you've got to have it, you've got to understand what you're doing with it so you can get the certs, get the certs issued, all that kind of stuff, yes? Now, one of the things is, is that we obviously give you code for all this, and I kind of quite honestly forgot what I put in for HTTPS. The real easy thing that you can do is terminate your uh, SSL at your load balancer. Then you don't have to no, I, I totally agree. Um, yeah, if you, you you can either put the certs on the website or put them on your load balancer if you have your That's external load balancer. Much easier to manage the certs with. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, so uh, an LCM config, oh, this is where I had put it. Here's one of the new LCM configurations, setting it up for a pull server for HTTPS. You can see that underneath settings, we've got the configuration repository web, which is different than it was with 4.0, uh, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, the name that you're going to call it, the URL, and what's that? It's a certificate thumbprint, right, for the certificate that you have on it. Um, and also, is just as part of this, I put in a little um, config of, now, I don't have the resource, I, I did this on a client box, I'm showing this off a client's box, so I don't have the resource, uh, PS desired state configuration out there, but if I did, um, you can uh, set up, and I just, um, I personally, I, if it's a server with a GUI on it, I put the console on it, but that's up to you. And you can set up your HTTPS pull server. Now, this is no different than actually the script they give you in the examples. I just added the console to it. <coughs> but, okay, I, <laughs> all you have to do is run this and you get one. Okay, you're not that impressed. You should have been more impressed. <laughs> Why is your compliance server still uh, HTTP? Probably because I forgot to change it. Allow unencrypted traffic, you're fired. 
Yeah, I know. I'm fired. Oh, and I think that's why I left this in here. Does that even look like it sounds good? <laughs> Notice how quickly his eyes hit it, right? What the hell's going on over there, Jason? Um, allow unaccredited. Yeah, and the thing is, I think if you, if you look at a lot of the resources that you see on the internet right now, when, when 4.0 came out, everybody was doing HTTP just to get it to work in a lab. Yeah, this is great. This is easy. So a lot of the examples are that, but that's not what you want to do. You want to be HTTPS. Okay, credentials. I mean, before you oh, even go ahead. into the privacy aspect of that, of, of not letting people, what happens if somebody stands up a man in the middle configuration and you think you're pulling down the one that you wrote and somebody just uh, downloads, you know, mini cats or whatever? Uh, bad I like news. Those. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. You, you like men in the middle? Okay. No, not men in the middle. I, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> not what I meant. <laughs> But the whole lols cats, the middle of the cat. Yeah, 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 okay. That's a scary tool. This is going to be a tricky topic. So let me just show the, the, the simple dumb thing, and then, because okay. then, there's more to this. Credentials. You guys have any need to, when you send a config, pass credentials? All right, so, and we show this in the MVA, and I'm just going to kind of show you right now. You see this done wrong, because so, everybody just gives up. This is a lack of understanding of certificates and PKI, and they give up, and this is horrifying when you make that mistake. Don't give up. So let me open this up. I've got, and I, it's one of my favorite things. Because when I first started playing with this on credentials, this was, um, oh, how did I do this? Um, I think I did it this way. Okay, so in the uh, uh, configuration, you can set up your configuration. So here's a simple file configuration, and I want to use credentials. So I can pass it credentials. But when you try to use this, you're going to get an error message because this needs configuration data that says you are allowed to pass credentials. So let me show that to you. And... I think this is the one, yeah, 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 yeah. And let me just bring up the configuration data. So we need this, and you can do this in the same file, but we need a configuration data thing. And notice all nodes, probably seen a lot of that this week. Node name, and look at this word. Yep, fired. <laughs> Does that even look like it's gonna be a good thing? You know how many times I've seen this with guys using this? In other words, they wanna pass a credential. They don't understand anything about PKI and certificates, but they understood how to go put in allow plain text back. You know what's gonna happen? When this gets run, the ma file, you know when you run the config, you get the ma file, you have your username and your password and clear text in the moth. Take that and send it through a Perl server on HTTP. Get it? I've seen, I see this, oh. <coughs> you're, you're looking at the moth going, you're an idiot, as it goes through the pulse server out to the machines, right? So how do you do this? Well, there's, let me show you a way. First of all, we don't want to allow plain text passwords, so I'm going to show you something. Now, I gave you this, so it's all written out for you, but you still have to go out and do it. It's right here about step 11. you got to have a certificate. Okay, and when I was doing this at the MBA, I already had mine set up, but I gave the instructions. You gotta have a certificate authority, and I had mine on the domain control. You need a workstation authentication cert. Because you gotta get that out to the machines, because here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna use that cert to encrypt the password, then it's gonna go across encrypted. The MOF file will have that funny looking string of blah, 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 blah. It's gonna go to that machine, and then that machine can unencrypt it and then use it. So that way you're not passing that password in clear text. Does that kind of make sense? And you can configure group policy to automatically register and deploy. Yes, you can. Extent. But here's what I saw is, as I was putting this together, I've seen so many people, a lot of people have no idea how to do this. None. So they do the allow plain text just to get it to work. And they're using it in production. That's not cool. So if you don't know certificates, learn the PKI stuff. Don't go nuts on learning all the cryptos because that'll make your brains explode. But learn how to get these certificates out, right? And go. But I just want to point out that you, you don't actually need a full PKI for DSC if you don't want to. Because of the way you set up the configurations, you it's like certificate pinning. You tell it exactly what certificate thumbprint you trust. So you don't need the chain of trust in the CA and stuff. You can do this with self-signed certificates, and it's still perfectly fine. 
Yeah, and in this case, I used um, just uh, ADCS, so Active Directory Certificate Services. I gave you instructions on how to export the cert, get it out. You can do this with group policies, but you need to get the cert out. You can use self-signed, but you need a cert. And if you do the cert, then you end up with, and I'm, I'm not going to run it, but it, like I said, in the MOF, it gets encrypted. So I've given you examples of both doing it where you're passing the credential and where you're setting up the config data, where now you're giving it the location to the cert and life is good. What? I, there's also a thumbprint key and I can't remember if you need both or if it's okay to just hey, do the You can just do that, at least right now. Well, let me put it this way. In the February release, I could just get it, because I put the thumbprint in and it didn't make a difference. I always wondered about that. I was like, yeah. why can't you just get it from the file? So. Yeah, you can. Either or? Either or? Okay. okay. Which is actually great flexibility because I think when I was doing it, it was easier to get it from the file in this case than it was from the thumbprint. But Jason, uh, do you have to make a change to your? Uh, so if this is the change you're making uh, on that language. Yeah, do, do you have to make any changes to your Git credential um, setting that's actually in the config? So just no. As a matter of fact, I I I I'm giving you this example. Look at what I'm doing. I'm just I just literally did just get credential. He's got to get that configuration data, but I'm just doing just. Get credential, and he just yeah. bang. So when you when you compile the configuration to a MOF, when you run uh, dir test dash credential, etc., DSC will take that configuration data and it'll turn the PS credential in memory and right. use that certificate to encrypt the password. I don't have anything set up. This is just you can still just create the configuration. Just create, yeah, just run to create the MOF and show them show the MOF. I don't. The directory paths aren't correct, yeah. so okay. well, it's not a big deal. Scripts, yeah. It's not a big deal. So no matter whether it's self-signed or whether it's issued by a CA, you still have to use the configuration data the same way and set up the LCA the same way. Now, okay. is that a script sign cert or is that a machine cert? It doesn't, um, it doesn't really matter. Any RSA cert will do. Okay. Um, didn't you guys say it was a workstation? Yeah, no, it has to be a machine. It has to be, it has to be, a, it has to be the client authorization cert, so it's a workstation right. cert. Okay. Code signing Yeah, it does actually have to be that cert. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah so cert for signing only, but if you, um, if you use the new self-signed certificate commandlet, it works with DSC. Which I hadn't done, so. Um, I'll try to see if I, I just changed the path, so I'm going to see if I can make Jeff happy real quick. Um, we're setting up uh, HTTPS pull server. Yes. Um, how are you getting new the certificate onto the new machines? Do you have some sort of like chicken and egg issue? Um, sort of. You, you're like how do you push down a configuration with the certificate if you can't if the certificate's not already on the right? Device? You're, you're going to have some sort of bootstrap. Yeah, my direct. I don't the have the where you can desired state. To yeah. talk to the pull server. All right. At that time, you're also going to have to do some work related to certificates. Okay. Um, and that's kind of homegrown in a lot of environments right now, but. At, at that moment is the right time to do it. So, for example, in, in my environment, um, where we would bring up a new uh, VM on you know, Azure or AWS or whatever, we would have a bootstrap script that runs when the VM comes up, runs new self-signed certificate, generates a new configuration GUID, just randomly generated stuff, configures the LCM. Our provisioning <coughs> script, pull that certificate and that GUID off and put it into our source control, at which point the MOFs can be compiled. And then all, that's all that matters is that the machine that's compiling the MOF or the machine that's receiving it agree on the certificate. Now, did you want to mention anything about the, the concept yeah, of, because maybe he can help. Uh, did you want to mention anything about the concept of authenticating when you communicate to <coughs> the whole server? Like, at least the concept of it? Yeah, we, we talked about this um, kind of badly yesterday. It's not something okay. that I've worked with yet, but I think when you configure the LCM, Basically, you can set up a pull server that requires authentication, and the, and the LCM can authenticate. So that even though it's HTTPS, if somebody knows the URL, they can still browse your stuff. And if you force it to require authentication, you shut that vulnerability down as well. So, like any HTTPS website that you would set up requiring like basic auth or whatever, where you have to sign in, we can do that, right? Yeah. It, so, this is a great thing because, as he points out. You guys can hit that, that, that web service and you guys can, you can start perusing that pull server. Even though it's secured traffic, anybody can peruse it. Well, now you can require authentication to it so that man in the middle, you know, browsing through it can't be done, which I think is really important. The, the, the pull server is OData, which makes it yeah. really convenient oh, yeah. for the guy that wants to steal your stuff. Right. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> they, know exactly, exactly. they know exactly the framework. Um, a couple of the things um, that we have here. Um, 
class-based custom resources. I want to make sure that I show this to you um, and and get um, you know your feedback on this. But let me bring this up. I'm going to bring up the old and the new. I think I'm going to bring up the old and the new. So when you're on the uh, internet, you're going to see the uh, old way, which I, I know this is really small on my screen because of the resolution. You can't really tell, but I kind of want you to see the structure of this. Here's a resource that I've gone into called MBA Demo. It's the one that we used if you download it. And you've got this folder, DSC Resources. ENUS is where I put the help file. I'm going to show you the help file because we have a way for you to do help files that we've decided is a good practice. Don't know about being best, but you'll hear it from June Blender today too, which he goes through all the help stuff. Um, there, you'll notice that I've got a manifest here for the custom resource. Go ahead. In the preview version that you're not supposed to be showing, but are anyway, since we're already <laughs> out of the back here, I'm just going to mention that there's something related to DSC resources and help coming inbox, which is going to be cool. Awesome. Underneath DSC resources, you'd put the individual resources that you're creating, and I wanted to show you some of this now old code. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a PSM1, which is uh, a, a, an old resource. This is what the old resources, when you wrote a custom resource, looked like. They were three functions, um, uh, uh, get target resource, set target resource, test target resource. This is where you would put your, I say imperative code, but this is where you'd put your do this, do this, do this, do this, do this code, and it would become a resource. But if you look at this, well, this, this you could do this. This is just, it's very, just like an advanced you know, com, you know, function kind of thing. <clears throat> Very doable. So IT guys are like, yeah, I can, I can pull this off. But we're missing some things here. We need parameters or properties that we're going to be using with this resource. They're not in here. They're in a schema mod file that we have to have. And there's all these different folder locations. And it's, well, with, with the February release, they have a nice example in the readme. Do you guys ever do the readme notes? OK, we, 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 we got to start. because. They have a really nice example. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yes, it is. And so, and that's where I had originally started with it because I was trying to figure it out. And let me just show you. The new way is, so I'm going to go into uh, authorization. I've got ENUS. This is where I've got an about. Well, apparently, I don't. <laughs> oh, the file type. Okay. I'll show you in a minute in PowerShell, but there's an about under. It's just a text file. And it becomes an about underscore. And the idea with an about underscore help file is you're explaining what everything is in those modules. In other words, what are all the resources? You give a lot of examples. I'll show you an example here in just a second. I think I will. Uh, and here's also examples uh, that, I've, that I've put in there. And here's the actual structure. Now, I've got, you don't need this file. I'm just going to get rid of it. Sorry, this is a, a remnant for me screwing around. I've got uh, the manifest. And I've got one PSM. Notice I've solved a lot of the folder stuff, and I've got all of my resources now in here. So here's where I've defined all of my properties for it. So I don't need a separate schema mod file for this. It's all done right here. And down here's where I started making my class. Oops, where did I go? Up here at the top is the class definition. Woo! And down here's where I've got the functions in there, get, set, and test and you put your imperative code in there now this is the example i was using for uh, powershell web access look at the operational code i got it was really easy set add psw it was a command line so it was like and it became a real resource that i could use now in dsc oh come on <laughs> smaller code easier code it's the good code so the idea is this don't even waste your time with the old way just write everything in class-based resources now Remember where we're at right now, right? They're still working on this. So remember where we're at with this. But rather than waste too much time on the old way like a lot of us did, I think that most IT guys are going to find it easier, because I was, I was afraid of it, are going to find it easier to do class-based resources than the ones that look like advanced functions, because they're easier to read and easier to deal with um, kind of thing. Can you show what a, a schema.mov file looks like just to... I had to one out there. Years. I don't know what I did with it. Yes, I can. And let me, in fact, let me go over here because I have one. Because in, in the WMF4 way of doing things, not only did you have two different files, you had your PSM1 file, you had your schema.mov, um, you had duplication inside the PSM1 file, the param blocks of the target resource, <laughs> set and test target resource, had to uh, follow certain rules. So the test and set methods had to have identical parameter blocks. If there was anything different, then something was probably going to blow up with your resource. 
the get target resource had to have only the mandatory parameters and not the other stuff. Well, or I guess you could optional put it there, but it was useless. And then the schema.mof had to be in agreement. So there's so many opportunities to go wrong when you're writing a new resource and make something that's going to blow up. And in class-based, it's all in one file, and it's all easy. You just stick you know, a uh, DSC resource attribute on the class. You put the uh, DSC key property or read property or whatever resources on the properties of the class, and you're done. And here's the point, and I think Jeffrey points this out during the MBA, and it's one of the things that I ran into is, I don't know if you guys really have been looking much at the MOFs. I mean, we've been telling everybody you shouldn't have to deal with MOFs. You shouldn't have to learn MOF. That's the whole point. It's just the thing under, you know, the, the, the standards-based way of talking underneath. You shouldn't have to, but reading MOF is not that hard. You've, if you look at a MOF or, of your configuration, you can pretty much figure it out. Here's where it gets hard. As soon as you need to touch it and edit it, you're going to screw it up. So you're going to create a custom resource. If you do it the old way, you're creating a custom resource, which means you can do a lot of editing and a lot of changing. You are going to have to edit this directly. Now, there is an X resource designer that would create this the first time, but then you got to go back and edit this. The odds of getting this to work with all those other things that, that Dave mentions, in class space, it's all right there in front of you. You can't, I mean, it's almost you can't screw it up. It's right there in front of you. Okay. Is there any way in the ICE to tell it to uh, do syntax? Highlighting and all the stuff that goes on with uh, regular PS1 files. In a MOF, it would show you where it not in a MOF. Um, ISE steroids, that. I believe, lets you define other languages. I don't think one exists for MOF files right now, but I think it should be possible. The ISE by itself, no. The ISE will though give you everything you need for syntax highlighting and, and, and helping you build the syntax for class-based resources. But there's nothing in there for MOF, and I, I haven't looked at steroids on the MOF stuff, so I. Well, one of the recent versions, like he added syntax highlighting for VB scripts and made it a totally extensible thing where you can write a, a language definition. And, and oh, and put it in there for mod? That makes a lot of sense. Just like you can in Notepad++? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Are there any snippets built into Notepad5's ISE uh, for class-based? Th not, not yet, but David. Okay. Yeah. That's like help documentation. They do that last time. <laughs> so, do you want to talk about depends on? Because I have a configuration, and it depends on is one of the most important things to me. I've got depends on right now. Do you have depends? <laughs> <laughs> Always. We only have a few minutes left, and let's see if we can make it through. Okay, uh, okay depends on is. And I'll bring up an example why you. In a in a compiled configuration in a MOF document that gets pushed down to a server, depends on is really the only logic you're allowed to define only orchestration between resources. Everything else is just do this, do this, do this. Um, it happens to go in order from top to bottom, but that's not guaranteed. So you want to use depends on to make sure that your resources always apply in the right order. Now, in, in the original WMF4 release, that worked fantastic as long as you were dealing with individual resources, but composite resources, um, which is where you can take a configuration and use it like a resource in another configuration, you couldn't define dependencies there. You can now, there, there may still be some problems, I'm not sure if they're fixed yet, where if you have nested composite configurations, <coughs> it's a little weird. So there were uh, two places they fixed it, the November 2014 update, mm -hmm. that fix depends on composite resources mainly, and then there were small leftovers that got fixed in the April Oh, yes, excellent. Whoever so. opened the bug and connect, they will be closed with the thank you note. Cool. <laughs> cool. With the thank you so, note. So yes, that <laughs> depends on becomes something you can use anywhere, even if you have you know, 15 inception layers of composite resources, if that's what you want to do, it'll still work, so awesome. But what we, what, what and I, I you know, I, I envision a day, and I'm, I'm not giving out anything that's NDA, because I actually don't know the answer to this. I know, I already screwed up and did that. I don't know the answer to this, I'm just thinking in my head, that right now, you know, the, the order that you write it in ain't necessarily the order the LCM is going to have it execute, because some things take longer than others, and. What if the LCM could do multiple things at once? And what if the LCM is going to do multiple things at once and I don't have depends on? It could be starting processes that are <laughs> 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 You got to always have depends on. <laughs> there we go. It's going to start doing stuff that it can't do because there were prerequisite things. So as you can tell, if you look at my example scripts, I am very, I don't want to say anal with depends on, but yes. <laughs> 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 Wait a minute, I, there's one last, one last thing I want to show you, and so you can get some questions. I said I wanted to show you these documents. These are the documents I gave you new links for, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, oh, just 
Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it, computer. Um, I just want to go out and bring a couple of these up so you kind of get the idea of, 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 of what you're dealing with here. Um, first of all, the, um, the when you get a preview or you get the real thing or whatever, you're going to have, oh, man, you are so ridiculously small, bro. <laughs> you're going <laughs> to, thank you. Uh, you're going to have these release notes. Now, I have to tell you, one of the most <coughs> useful things in the world to me was the February's version release notes. They added a lot of interesting things. One of the things is, is let me just kind of scroll through it because they'll tell you how to get it installed, yada, yada, yada. Um, they will tell you, look, develop DSC resources with classes in PowerShell. Stable. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, how far do I want to waste my time until this thing ships? If it's stable, now's a good time to start wasting your time. If it's experimental, what does that mean in your head? Change. Okay, one, it's probably going to change. It may get removed. There are a few things that are experimental that I'm praying don't get removed, but I know it might happen, so I don't want to, you know, invest a whole lot. Notice that when this is not available, that's something that was there and isn't there, so it can happen. Yeah, things get removed, but experimental also means when you're testing it, it might break. If it breaks, where do you go? Everybody at once, connect. Okay, you. This is your community support to help us. You can also go to the forum, you know, the DSC forums, and put something up. But go to connect and see if it's been logged, because this is what we really. The team needs this feedback desperately. But this is really cool. So you can go through this. And what I think is really cool is they give you. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's stable. Um, they give you ah, excellent examples. Now, caution. This, your mileage may vary. In other words, it may not work in your particular environment. You may have to tweak it a little bit, something like that. But they've done a really good job with giving you lots of examples on the different topics. Now, keep in mind, this isn't just all DSC all day, all night. There's other things in PowerShell they're playing with. So you're going to have other stuff in here. But there's a lot of great, well-documented information in here to get started with. That's very helpful, wouldn't you say? Also, one of the other ones I wanted to bring up, uh, besides the readme, which you really, and I mean, you go through this, you didn't read it. That way you know what your capabilities are, right? So, I mean, it's worth reading every single word. Um, but Microsoft on their blog site, so the PowerShell team on their blog site has started putting together these best patterns and practices. And in this case, this is for designing uh, DSC resources. One of the things is, is that the community, it took us years to put together those best practices on, you know, the advanced functions and all that kind of stuff. It took us years to finally convince people not to use Writehost. It's one of my favorite ones. You guys aren't laughing, so are you using right host? You know what's awesome? <laughs> it does colors. April preview. <laughs> <laughs> uh, April preview or the one that's out on the Windows 10 right now, right host is now like everybody's new friend. <laughs> it does color. You can I'm capture you, it's it. It's got its own stream. Yeah, our right host is the new it's the, it's the It's the destroyer of <laughs> objects. Don't use Anyways, anyways, having said that, right this is, is right verbose light. <laughs> right. So here's the list, and then you can click on this, and it'll take you to the deep dive sections where they explain this. Now, I want you to notice how much stuff is on this list. And then you've got big words that I have no idea what they mean. That's why I have to read this thing. Where's the indep independent, indepoted, indep right, right. Right. Item right. Number four. Number four? Yeah. What the hell is That's why you have to go read it, so make sure that you're doing it right. They are trying to help us desperately so that we get on the right footing initially. Now, this means... One of the things that I've noticed with IT guys, because I'm one, one of the things that my best mate is this real big famous developer dude. And I, I asked him once, I said, you know, because he's famous for writing perfect code, beautiful code. And it irritates me because he's British and he's pompous, not Richard. <laughs> <laughs> but he's British and so, and I would run up to him and I go, look at what I've done with PowerShell. And he, you know, how good for you, so. <laughs> I asked him once, I said, how much time do you spend, you write this beautiful elegant code, how much time do you spend writing your code? I want to learn. He said, well, sir, I spent exactly four hours on Friday afternoon writing code. I'm like, oh, you're so full of crap. You probably spend 60, 70 hours a week banging on code and that. No, sir. What were you do the rest of the week, playing PlayStation or whatever? No, sir, I spend the rest of the week thinking about the code. In other words, 
finding the solution, researching the solution, researching what is it I'm supposed to be doing, how do I fix this problem, then code the answer. How many of you actually start solving the problem by, by opening up the ISE and going, well, I'm going to start with an advanced function. Now, I, the, I start with the shell, right? I, that's my research, right? I'm researching how do I use the commandlet, how do I solve it? That's the research side. Don't be afraid of doing the research. We have to at this point. If you're an IT guy, we're becoming developers, which is a good thing, not a bad thing. And we got to do the research up front, and they're working really hard with this. So what, what would you like to add? And, and, and even if you want to add something. Yeah. So uh, whatever is on this blog post, will move it on GitHub so you can contribute, make it better, fix the English. Oh, excellent. The and so on. So uh, I think there's a talk at 4 o'clock uh, at log. There we'll go through the five steps to how to work with Git, because I know I am the new one, and I started playing with it. OK, what are the five steps? So get used to using Git. There are resources going there. In future, more stuff will come there. I cannot tell what at this point. And documentation, <coughs> fixes, guidelines, all will go there. So and, and just for clarification, when you say Git, because a lot of the, the PowerShell team members, and, and, and you'll hear us just say Git, and I've had this question. Do they mean GitHub? Do they mean one Git? Do they mean what? Git. what? Yeah, so yeah, so that's the location um, for it. We need to do a video or something on using get. So yes, get. we could get get get. What questions do you have? Because we're out of time, but go ahead and ask if <laughs> as I pull the laptop down so and ask him. I know, as a matter of fact, I had this big thing where I said, I'm not going to, it's a blind, they, they don't know how to screw them, they should know it, they should know PKI. And I went, no, nobody knows this, and it's not easy, so I, t I take you through it on the NBA when we do the secured poll server. So check that out first. It actually is. <coughs> if you're in a domain environment and you're using a Windows Enterprise CA, it really is that easy. Yeah, yeah, that's like that. so yeah. A server comes up, boom, you got a certain if you want to set up a website, it's already there waiting for you. And I think they have the resource coming on setting up the Nice. Very nice. Yeah. What else? Ask him. Ask him while he's here. Ask him while he's here. Did you guys enjoy your MVPs while you still had them? Yeah. Yeah. What? Did you enjoy your MVP while you still had it? Yeah, I know. It was it was it was it was it was it was, it was, it was enjoyable and now it's gone. So that's true. If session and evaluation is Jason, not you. Yeah, speaking of which, do your, please go out and do the session evals. And if you missed any, go out and do the session evals. And by the way, if you do my session evals, yeah, you can go ahead and say, you know, enjoy the last days of your MVP. So, question. I was just wondering on, I know you didn't do any examples on this, but most of the examples I've seen online on the configuration data tend to use kind of node-centric configuration where you say this node has this role, this role, this role. Yes. Rather than a service-centric where you say this service exists on this node, this node, this node. Is that's there a best practice there? I don't think there's a best practice, and that's a big topic mm -hmm. that we probably can't cover in yeah. negative three minutes. But um, it's, it, to it, me there's, it there's DSC tooling out in PowerShell.org that Steve Murawski wrote for Stack Exchange and that has been updated. And it's an example.